So thank you all for uh, being here. As always, thank you to the organizers uh, for putting all of this together, uh, to the technical staff for uh, making everything run mostly smoothly. And um, uh, yeah, so um, uh, two gatherings ago, I gave a talk about uh, Raymond Smullyan's um, logic puzzles and his popular books. And uh, that's probably what he's best known for. And um, uh, at that time, though, I mentioned that uh, I, I would not talk about his actual mathematical research, uh, just for lack of time. Uh, so when Shelley Kronzak approached me about um, uh, you know, participating in this uh, session for, for Raymond, uh, I thought maybe this would be a good time to talk a little bit about uh, his actual mathematical work um, you know, and the many obituaries for him that appeared after his death. Uh, of course, everyone talked about his popular level book and his logic puzzles and, uh, and, and all of that kind of material. But he was a very accomplished mathematician and uh, working in areas of logic and set theory. And um, uh, in particular, he was the author or co-author of uh, eight technical books, uh, the first one being uh, Theory of Formal Systems, which was published in 1961, uh, and the last one being A Beginner's Further Guide to Mathematical Logic. That was a sequel to a book called A Beginner's Guide to Mathematical Logic. Uh, he was also the author of um, uh, over 40 research papers uh, in mathematical logic and some in set theory. And uh, that's a pretty impressive output, especially when you consider just how late uh, Raymond started in mathematics. He didn't get his PhD until he was already 40 years old. Uh, so that was quite an impressive output, and many of those papers uh, have been um, uh, very influential uh, to, you know, to people in the field. This, of course, is in addition to all of his, uh, his popular level puzzle books and his, his books of chess problems and spirituality and uh, you know, his books of anecdotes and jokes and riddles and all the uh, other uh, uh, wonderful things he produced. Uh, so I want to give just a brief flavor. I don't want to be real technical, but I do want to give uh, some of the flavor of uh, the kind of problems that he thought about. And um, uh, probably the overarching theme in Smolian's work was that of self-reference. And um, so as an example of what I mean by self-reference, um, you might be familiar with the Epimenides uh, paradox. Uh, Epimenides, uh, writing in antiquity, himself a cretin, uh, said that all cretins are liars. And uh, the problem comes if you try to imagine that this statement is true, uh, what would that mean? If it's true, uh, then uh, Epimenides himself would be a liar. Uh, but then we have a liar telling the truth, and that's not possible. Uh, now, this is often uh, first presented as uh, uh, this is often presented as the first uh, uh, first occasion of the um, liar paradox. Uh, it should be pointed out, though, that in this form, there's there's no actual paradox here, right? Because you can just imagine that what Epimenides is saying here uh, is just straightforwardly false. Um, but it does lead uh, to a, to a genuine paradox, where you take the sentence, uh, "This sentence is false," and you try to imagine what would happen if you assign a truth value to that. And no matter how you do it, if you try to assume that it's true, well, it, the, the, OK, it's true. So then what it asserts is really the case. But it asserts its own falseness. Uh, and that's already a problem. And a similar uh, issue is going to arise if you try to imagine that it's false. So anyway, philosophers have a good time with this. There's uh, a, uh, you know, a tremendous literature uh, you know, trying to figure out what to do about this, <laughs> like what's wrong with our conception of truth that this sentence doesn't seem to apply. And uh, I can assure you uh, that that body of literature does not make for light reading. Uh, so, uh, you know. <laughs> So, so, so enter at your peril. Uh, so this is an example of what I'm calling bad self-reference. Uh, another instance of bad self-reference, maybe you know, comes from set theory. And you can imagine, you know, anytime you give a, you know, a predicate, a criterion, uh, you should be able to talk about the set of all things that satisfy that criterion. And this uh, leaves open the possibility that a set might actually answer to its own description, its own criterion. And I give some examples. They say, uh, you know, uh, if you talk about the set of all abstract ideas, well, that is itself an abstract idea. So that's a set that contains itself. Uh, the set of all hamburgers is not itself a hamburger. Okay, so, so it's, you know, that set is not an element of itself. Okay, so given this, um, uh, we have what's known as Russell's paradox. So we imagine uh, x there being a set. And now I'll define this set capital N, and there's the admissions requirement for being an N. Uh, the way x is an element of N uh, is if x is not an element of itself. And then you ask yourself the question, well, what happens if x were actually equal to N? Like, what if we applied this admissions requirement to N itself? And then suddenly you get this statement, N is an element of N if and only if N is not an element of N. Uh, and that is just straightforwardly a contradiction. OK, so this, of course, is known as Russell's paradox. Uh, and this is also a pretty big deal, uh, because uh, it's hard to imagine anything more fundamental and more intuitive than the idea that, given a criterion or a predicate, there really should be a set that consists of precisely those elements that uh, satisfy that predicate. And yet, that most fundamental intuition uh, about set theory turns out to be uh, un unworkable. You need, you need something more sophisticated than that. OK, so these are instances of bad self-reference. And uh, at this point, you might just say, OK, new rule, no self-reference. Okay. Uh, but you don't want to do that either, because there are also good instances of self-reference. There are instances where self-reference seems perfectly fine, perfectly uncontroversial. If I say uh, th uh, this sentence is five words long, that seems fine, right? I mean, that seems perfectly coherent. Uh, probably the most famous uh, instance of good self-reference is Gödel's theorem, 
Uh, and in his first incompleteness theorem, he showed that uh, any axiom system, any formal language, let's say, uh, adequate for expressing, uh, you know, uh, truths of elementary number theory, there would always be statements that are true uh, but unprovable, uh, as assuming that the theory is, in fact, consistent. Uh, that, that's also an option. It could just be the theory is not consistent. Uh, and essentially, the key to doing that was to create a sentence in the language that, that, that asserted its own unprovability. Basically, he, he devised a way of saying this sentence is unprovable, uh, and that's going to be you know, a serious problem, because if we decide that that's false, then you have a false statement that actually is provable, and that's inconsistent. Um, so you decide, okay, it must be true, but then you have a statement that's true but unprovable, which was you know, exactly the point. Now, um, what, you know, now there, there is a bit of a technical point that we should mention here. Like what, one reason this is such a difficult thing to prove is that if you take, say, a, you know, a typical formal, you know, a formal system for uh, arithmetic, say, pianos, axioms, or something like that, uh, well, within that language, you can't really construct uh, you know, a well-formed formula that is also uh, self-referential. That's not possible. So the key to Goodall's proof um, lay in this distinction between theory and meta-theory, or language and meta-language. Uh, and that the idea, the distinction is this. Um, you know, there, you, you make a distinction between reasoning within a formal system and then speaking about the formal system from outside. And that's the distinction between, uh, you know, theory and meta-theory. Um, maybe a nice example would be, uh, you know, say, say you're doing formal logic. Okay, and you're trying to understand logical connectives in English and, or, if, then, things like that. So you construct a formal language for doing that. Um, okay, um, so the formal language is, in, in a sense, a model of the real language, and then you study the formal language. But what if the object of your studies are themselves formal languages? Okay, so you apply techniques of logic to logic itself. That would be, uh, you know, that would be what we call meta-logic. And, uh, and meta-mathematics is the same basic idea. So the key to Goodall's proof uh, was that uh, he, he basically devised a way of entailing the meta-theory of arithmetic within uh, the theory of arithmetic, and that was the key to making it work. So uh, these are the ideas, then, um, that, uh, that basically animated all of Smolian's mathematical research, the ideas of self-reference, uh, the underlying ideas in Goodall's theorems, uh, and, all of this, and the relationship of all of this to meta-mathematics. And in fact, the first paper he ever published was called Languages in Which Self-Reference is Possible. Uh, and uh, basically, the accomplishment there was uh, he devised a much simpler approach uh, to the whole topic of self-reference than, than Gödel himself used, uh, or, or successors of Gödel like Rosser and Tarski, these are other big names in logic. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the one that started it all. And um, he also wrote two especially important uh, technical books, one called simply Gödel's Incompleteness Theorems, and another one called Recursion Theory for Metamathematics. And I have to tell you, every time I look at that title, Recursion for Metamathematics, that just looks really sexy to me. Uh, it's uh, like that, that, that yeah, I, 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 I want to read that. Um, yeah, I must say, uh, if you actually get a copy of the book, you might be a little daunted. Uh, but, uh, whew, recursion theory for metamathematics. Okay. Um, and I should point out that the Goodall's Incompleteness Theorems book uh, actually starts with a whole series of puzzles, uh, introducing some of the main ideas. And that's also kind of a theme in Smolian's work, that there, maybe there isn't such a clear distinction between puzzles and serious work. Uh, okay, so I'll just quickly mention a couple of other ones. Uh, his first book, uh, uh, well, uh, his, technically his second book, was uh, called First Order Logic. And uh, that, too, was a very original uh, and very influential presentation of its subject matter. That book is still in print today, thanks to Dover, and uh, that one's well worth reading. Uh, I'd also mention his book, Set Theory and the Continuum Hypothesis. That was co-authored with his PhD student, Melvin Fitting. And one especially nice feature of that book is, the, uh, the, is his discussion of the technique of forcing, which is a very kind of difficult idea in uh, set theory. And um, I think they give probably one of the most lucid uh, presentations of that, you know, Fitting and Smolian. Uh, his last two books uh, were A Beginner's Guide to Mathematical Logic and A Beginner's Further Guide to Mathematical Logic. And I would say that uh, even though one might reasonably uh, question Smolian's understanding of what a beginner is, um, uh, <laughs> those, uh, th those books are well worth a read. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'll just, uh, I'll just conclude by saying if you want to pursue this any farther, there are two books you can choose. Uh, the, the big blue book there, uh, that came out just earlier this year, published by Springer, uh, edited by Mel Fitting again, and also uh, Brian Raymond. And, uh, and basically, that's a book uh, largely discussing his, his technical ma mathematics, uh, the kinds of things I was just talking about, only in much more detail. And it's, and it's a lot of essays that were inspired you know, by that work. So it's a fairly high-level book, but, but quite good. I'm still having fun going through it. And if, and if I may, uh, I could also mention uh, my own book, uh, Four Lives, that I edited, uh, which also has a few sections discussing his uh, technical work, but also has remembrances and anecdotes about him, as well as excerpts from his work. OK, so that's, uh, that's it for me. And uh, I'll just uh, hand this off to, to Shelley Kronzak now, who will uh, uh, take round two. Mm -hmm. Thank you.